This video is brought to you by Mantis Sleep. For the day, one of the most horrific and brutal animated films ever made. No joke, I am tossing out a content warning right out the gate. If you can't stomach murder, torture, and above all else, cruelty to animals, you might want to skip this one. But know that the movie itself is a social commentary that uses these themes to make a point, to explore the uncomfortable world of animal testing and using cats as a vessel to discuss eugenics. Also, there's a uh, sexy time in the film, which I'm sure in the eyes of YouTube is far worse than, you know, the murder. It's almost like YouTube can cover their eyes for the mature themes of violence, but takes the mask off when a boob is shown. Well, if they're gonna be using mask, then they should be using the mask for the sponsor of this video, Man to Sleep. Boy, I'm sure they're really excited how I put this ad in this video with that kind of introduction. You're welcome, Manta. What is Manta sleep, you ask? Yeah, I know you're asking that question right now. You're not skipping ahead of the video. Well, guess what? They make the world's best sleep mask and functional sleep accessories. The like king of the hill, you hang with propane and propane accessories. But there is more to Manta than that, damn it. Everything they do is fueled by their drive to enable better lives through better sleep and regular naps. Guys, I'll be real. I don't take naps. These guys do. That's just how I'm built. I do sleep though. And I'm with them on this one. You have to have good sleep. Good sleep makes it for when you actually are awake. You know, when you're alive. I'm not saying you're like dead when you sleep. Kind of. But no, when you're awake, you want to have that energy. Good sleep is, believe it or not, very important. And like Manti here has got like the pro nap movement. <laughs> Sorry, I'm about to laugh at that. <sighs> I'm part of the anti-nap movement. I walk into rooms like smack pots and pants. I'm just joking, Manta. But no, I, I, I get it. You know, I, I've taken like maybe three naps this entire year. And uh, for every single time I did take a nap, I felt amazing afterwards. And guess what? For every time I took a nap, I had a Manta sleep mask on. And let me tell you, folks, there are multiple Manta masks to pick from. It's like picking your Pokemon starter. You got like the Manta Sleep Mask default. You got the, the Sleep Mask Sound, the Mask Pro, the Cool Mask, you know, temperature-wise, not like, you know, aesthetically. The Steam Mask, not brought to you by Gabe Newell. The Weighted Mask, like in Naruto, you take it off and just hits the ground, poof, dust shoots up. For me, I had the default mask, the sleep mask, but I also got the mask pro, but I do use the like default mask. That's the one I've been using for like over a year now. Gets the job done. I put it over my face and just lights out. I, I, I feel this nice deep sleep just climbing through my brain. But I am going to uh, use my mask pro here soon. Apparently it's for deep sleepers. You got these little cups on the mask. You can like change the size for your eye cups. Uh, nice comfort. Like, there's no pressure on your eyelids or lashes. And you got again, advanced material and ventilation for like unmatched breathability. And a nice flow of air that helps. So yeah, even though I don't really nap, I do sleep at night. And I use my sleep mask for it. And it really does help a lot. Like sleep is stupid important. And this legit helps me to get that deep sleep. So check out Manta Sleep here at this link. Ta-da, there it is. And make sure to use my code SABERSPARK for 10% off your order. Do not sleep on this offer, haha. <laughs> Go hit him up today. All right, let's jump back into the uncomfortable world of cat murder. Do not forget the message of Claudandus. That is the key. Hop, hop, hop. In 1989, a writer named Akif Parenchi released a mystery novel that went on to claim massive success as an international bestseller. Due to the positive reception, Akif later followed it up with seven sequels. Now, uh, what kind of story premise could get this kind of public acclaim? Not to mention such a lucrative book deal for the author. Simple. Cats and murder. Exactly what it says on the tin. Originally hailing from Germany, Philidae is a dark and gritty tale following one cat's journey to find a serial killer in his new neighborhood. The author, Akif Parenchi, came up with the idea while watching his cat explore the Substadt district of Bonn, Germany, which I'm sure I said incorrectly. Also, I have a cold. I'm really uh, bringing my A-game today. Quote, I was watching my cat, Cujo, sneaking through the backyards of my neighborhood, and then it was clear to me. A cat like Cujo should be the detective in my new mystery novel." End quote. He continued saying the crime should make sense in the world of cats, fighting with teeth and claws, 
Uh, not with guns or car chases like lackadaisy. <laughs> Obviously, those pussycats need high-caliber ordinance for their dirty work, you know, instead of using their teeth like a, like a real cat. <laughs> uh, jokes aside, the world of Philidae was in its own separate parallel world to that of the humans. With a concept like that, along with a pretty hefty cat mating subplot, Perenchi struggled to find a publisher willing to give his crime novel a shot. When he did eventually get signed into a small publishing house, they only printed around 7,000 copies of the book. They assumed the subject matter was so niche that most people probably would not be into it. But once positive reviews came out, they couldn't keep copies on the shelves. Philidae became a bona fide bestseller. Five years later, Philidae was adapted into an adult-oriented animated film and was released on November 3rd, 1994 in Germany. You know, uh, come to think of it, uh, 1994 was an oddly big year for cat-centric movies, with The Lion King being released five months earlier in June. How did we somehow manage to get two animated movies in the same year featuring cats murdering each other as a major plot point? Like, what are the odds? But thankfully, only one had a gratuitous sex scene. Okay, uh, one gratuitous explicit sex scene. We all know what Nala was really up to during the love song. I mean, look at those eyes. Would you like to have a roll in the hay? Make no mistake, though, this movie is absolutely not for kids. Most adults will probably have issues stomaching the violence involving animals. I mean, I definitely did. There were some scenes where I had to turn away. I couldn't take it. Despite the appealing quality of the character animation, Philidae deals with a lot of seriously grim subject matter and you need to know that going into it. Okay, got it, right? Disclaimer over. So, let's get into the story. A tuxedo cat named Francis moves into a lackluster apartment with his owner and begins investigating a series of cat murders taking place in the neighborhood. He meets a slew of colorful characters, including Bluebeard, his gruff and food-obsessed cohort, and then Kong, a monstrously huge bully insistent on beating him up. Plus, other things. I mean, I think Kong here might be bi. And as for you, cutie pie, you can bet your sweet whiskers that you and me, just the two of us, got a date. Also, the guy looks like Taz meets uh, Beast from Beauty and the Beast, meets Pete from Goofy Movie, meets uh, <laughs> what looks like to me an old school shovel machine. Just look at that jaw. It's like the, <laughs> the cat with the virgin versus like the Chad, you know? The Nordic cat with the giga chin. Look at him, he's awesome. Uh, shortly after moving in, Francis begins having a series of nightmares. In the first one, he sees a faceless scientist trying to drag him down to hell with a chain collar. Gotta say, very creepy and very intense. Francis quickly discovers some less than normal cat behavior going on, even in his own house. Like, uh, he wakes up from the nightmare to the sounds of a massive cult of brainwashed cats. And said cats were like two floors above his own house, like in the building. Now, these cats were following the teachings of a godlike figure named Claudandus, as they electrocute themselves to death as tribute to his sacrifice. Yeah, for real, that's happening. Uh, just fun, wholesome stuff here, folks. The sermons are led by an impassioned cat named Joker would have somehow drawn the attention of both Bluebeard and Kong when Francis spots them in the crowd. Francis narrowly escapes capture from the religious zealots during a, an admittedly pretty engaging chase scene. You can really see how there's definitely a lot of attention put into capturing the agility and the, the anatomical movement of the cats. Also, just love the early use of CGI as Francis runs through the pipe. Looking for answers, Francis interviews other cats in the area for information, including a blind cat named Felicity. She reports overhearing the last cries of the victims, along with the gentle voice of another cat talking to them just before they die. Francis discovers a few consistencies in the cats who have perished. They are the same breed, male, unneutered, and die during a mating encounter. Just another Friday night for us boys, right? <laughs> With this knowledge, uh, Francis enlists the help of Pascal, a wise, tech-savvy cat who studies Gregor Mendel's theory of genetics. His owner is such a fan that he has a big, ominous portrait of him in the house, 
along with uh, a number of um, <laughs> positions from the Kama Sutra, I think. Well, I guess there's a market for everything. I'm gonna have to blur that out. Can't show the Kama Sutra in a YouTube video. It's a no-no. The cat murder's fine though. Pascal reveals that he has an extensive guide tracking the genetic background of every cat in the neighborhood. Well, that fancy computer of his, look at that, it's awesome. However, he reveals there has also been another victim in the cat murders, Felicity. The reveal of her death was shockingly brutal, but they do not hold back. After discovering her decapitated remains, Francis has another nightmare. This time, he envisions a field of dead cats, turned into puppets by a terrifying version of German biologist Gregor Mendel. Now, if the name is not ringing a bell, don't worry. We'll get more into him in a bit. This dream sequence, though, is incredible. I love the use of scratchy visuals and choppy frame rates. It really reminds me of the final animated segment of The Wall. These nightmares are prophetic with Francis stumbling upon a video diary in the basement the following morning. On it, a man named Dr. Praterius is seen experimenting on a variety of cats, including a scruffy one that becomes their mascot named Claudandus. The doctor becomes increasingly erratic. He's a drunken mess, rapidly losing assistants who can't tolerate the animal abuse any further and losing funding for his research. Notably, he believes Claudandus has begun talking to him before the tape ends. Yes, Claudandus, talk to me. <laughs> Fascinating idea. The animal has no sense of humor. What did he say? That I should release him from his cage and face him in hand-to-hand -hand combat? After that, Francis has a run-in with Kong before they come across the body of Solitaire, Kong's mate, along with her unborn kittens. Again, content warning, this is pretty brutal. Like it's truly a grisly scene that is so graphic that I probably can't even show it on here. Bluebeard and Francis follow a sickly looking cat from the murder site into the, huh, a pun time, catacombs beneath the town. During the interrogation, he's revealed to be Yesaya, the caretaker of the dead. Yesiah was also in the same lab as Claudandus and was freed after an explosion destroyed the lab, leading to a prison break of all the other trapped cats there. Joker lived with him there briefly, but Yesiah has been alone ever since. Francis discovers there's a connection in the catacombs. They're all the decaying remains of the murder victims, and uh, it's been going on for years. During his final nightmare, Francis imagines the local cats sitting in reverence to an exotic, sandy-colored cat with blue eyes. Introducing himself as the prophet Philidae, he beckons Francis to join them in rediscovering their roots among the stars. Francis then wakes up and comes across an Egyptian-looking female cat before they have a <laughs> weird, noisy cat sex. Yeah, it's, um, it's that part of the movie now, and I can't show it. I have to blur it out, or you have to watch a National Geographic or something. I will say this, the animators did their homework. <laughs> as uncomfortable as that is. Uh, she goes unnamed, but tells Francis her breed is both old and new. Sounds ominous, but okay. <laughs> sex is sex. Bluebeard echoes this, saying he's seen other cats like her around town. But there's something off about them. They're borderline feral and more unpredictable than a standard house cat. Francis decides the only way they can get the answers they need is to investigate Joker. He enlists the help of Bluebeard, and they split up, Francis heading to Pascal's home for research, while Bluebeard talks to Joker. But while exploring, Joker is nowhere to be found in the house. Pascal promises to help Francis and Bluebeard narrow down their list of suspects the following morning. Francis worries about Pascal becoming a victim himself, until Bluebeard mentions he's been neutered and is also dying of stomach cancer. During a meeting, Francis reports their discoveries to the rest of the neighborhood cats. That there have not been just seven murders, but a whopping 450 over the years. One of the cats, a small kitten, claims that Claudandus is still alive. Her great-grandfather, Joker, told her Claudandus survived when the lab burnt down and killed the cruel Dr. Praterius. Suspiciously, Pascal changes the subject, wanting to pursue Joker before it's too late. Francis heads back to Joker's home with Bluebeard and notices Joker's carcass on one of the shelves. He died willingly, 
with no struggle or defensive wounds in sight. Back at home, Francis reaches an epiphany. The cat that seduced him appeared to be an ancient Egyptian breed, and he figures this must have a genetic component. By connecting the dots to Gregor Mendel and restrictive cat breeding, Francis and Bluebeard discover Pascal's owner used to work in the testing lab, and the killer is trying to revert cats back to their old roots. This leaves them with only one suspect, Pascal. They head over to his home to investigate. Pascal attacks Bluebeard on the main floor and confronts Francis up in the study. He admits to everything, that he is Claudandus and murdered the doctor, Joker, and all the other cats he deemed as inferior from breeding. His rationalization of abusing Mendel's theory of genetics was to preserve the racial purity of Philidae and wanting Francis to be his successor to keep things moving. Claudandus blames man as being inherently cruel and irredeemable, seeing nothing but bad people in this world. Francis calls him out on this hypocrisy, as Claudandus values ancient cats above all else as the superior species and believes it is his right to kill those that will ruin his plan. Enraged, Francis tries to delete the cataloging program before Claudandus attacks him, launching into a violent battle, complete with a fire in the library. It's serendipitous, but this scene looks straight out of The Lion King. You even got Claudandus launching himself towards Francis, you know, just like Scar towards Simba. But uh, for Claudandus, he gets disemboweled in the process. In his dying words, Claudandus owns his behavior. He tried to right the wrongs of his own past, but did so in an unforgivable way. Francis leaves the burning house, dragging Bluebeard out with him. And uh, that's kind of the end of the movie. You know, except for Francis like winking at the camera being like, hey, I'm gonna go get some pussy. <laughs> Literally, at its core, Philidae is an intense watch with a very clear message. Being fiercely critical towards the horrors of animal testing, racial supremacy, and eugenics. But where it seems to struggle for a lot of people is the balance of the story. The plot itself is solid and straightforward, but the actual delivery of that message can be a bit overwhelming. It demands all of your attention to keep up with the story, as most of the critical plot points are brought up in conversation. It's kind of a bummer relative to the quality of the animation, but this creative choice is almost certainly due to staying within the limited budget. Animation is a notoriously expensive medium, and those action set pieces add up quickly. Now, upon the movie's release, how did the author feel about Philidae's adaptation? A pretty positive, it seems. Perenshi was quoted in this 2011 interview with Planet Weissen, I think it's Weissen or Weissen, stating, quote, I'm 80% satisfied with the film, end quote. <laughs> what a statement. He claimed to have a great working relationship with the screenwriter, Mark Kluger, and director, Michael Schock. Parenti also appreciated a drawing retreat with the artist in Hamburg, seeing the world of Philidae come to life before his very eyes. His only real complaint was wanting Francis to be a bit more mysterious than how he was presented. But hey, that's nothing a little hat and a magnifying glass can't fix. Yeah, there you go, only he's adorable. Now, go die. <gasps> and there in the backyard was my housewarming present. <sighs> Now that we've gone over the plot of Philidae, let's get into the themes. And man, are there a lot of them. First off, we have the heavy involvement of genetics in the film. Now, for those who need a reminder or have not taken biology before, Gregor Mendel was a German friar, biologist, and widely credited as the primary scientist behind hereditary genetics, specifically involving the crossbreeding of plants. See, I told you to be back. Mendel made this discovery in the mid 19th century by performing a series of experiments on pea plants to breed specific traits in their offspring. He was looking for a way to control genetic differences like height, seed shape, flower coloring, even the varying shapes of the pea pods. And, you know, pretty cool stuff when it comes to working with plants and species variants. These studies were all based around focusing on dominant and recessive traits. A common example with human genetics is colorblindness. If a family has a history of colorblindness in their ancestors, it can be transmitted to their offspring depending on which chromosomes they receive from their parents. These same methods of monitoring dominant and recessive traits were also used with the domestication of animals such as cows, chickens, dogs, and yep, you guessed, cats. Animals could now be raised to have hardier offspring, 
higher yields for eggs and greater varieties of coat colors, disease resistance, and longer lives. Where it veers into rough territory, though, is when it comes to manipulating such traits and human beings. Eugenics is the process of trying to control the gene pool by eliminating traits deemed as weakness in others. These weaknesses are often just a matter of personal preference for people wanting to play God with the lies of others. Regardless, eugenics was and is an outdated, unethical, and immoral form of pseudoscience with humans. It's also a justification used by racists and bigots to violate human rights, wanting to shape them to their own warped perspective. Interest in eugenics peaked during the beginning of the 20th century in the UK, the US, and other sections of Europe. Methods commonly used for enforcing it included sterilization, being institutionalized against their will, segregation, and you guessed it, huh, genocide. A certain man comes to mind. Unsurprisingly, during World War II, uh, the Nazis loved the concept of eugenics. The belief in the superiority of the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Aryans was a major focal point in propaganda ads and films. I'm sick of these kind of characters. I think we should kill Hitler. Nazi scientists dedicated a nightmarish amount of their time into finding baseless genetic evidence to prove the superiority of their hate group. They did this by doing countless inhumanely cruel tests on innocent people they had captured and forced to live in the concentration camps. So the parallels to this in Philidae are very deliberate. Dr. Praterius and his colleagues use brute force and cat domestication to their advantage. They abuse the inherent trust of humans with the cats to keep them caged up and subjected to gut-wrenching torture, all for the sake of testing human tissue adhesive. Now, whatever medical importance these experiments might have had at first is quickly lost to violence and cruelty. But the inclusion of eugenics is an intriguing concept, given the parallels in Philidae to human experimentation in Germany during World War II. I don't think it's a coincidence that the idealized prophet has sandy-colored fur and blue eyes in the film and is literally on an Egyptian lion-shaped statue, far above the other characters with their more obvious flaws. Francis struggles to fully understand where Claudandus is coming from, as he has a mostly casual relationship with his owner, Gustave. But his intelligence and resourceful nature makes him an ideal candidate for breeding but an unwilling successor. Claudandus is the way that he is because of how he was treated by the scientist. But he believes humans are genetically predisposed to being evil and incapable of change. Francis, though, is treated with kindness by his owner, but experiences both compassion and cruelty from the other cats, who have their own history with abuse and other external factors. It's that classic nurture versus nature argument. Claudandus had a perverse mission to try to fix the sins of humanity by taking matters into his own paws. He wanted to revert the cat's genetic bloodline back to its roots, independent of domestication, seeing it as the origin of their parasitic relationships with humans. We understand his motivation for this. His trust for humans was used and abused to the point of no return. Claudandus had witnessed horrors beyond what Francis or any of the other cats could imagine. He had endured torture and horrific animal testing, using what time he had in his cage to plot revenge. What's weird is Pascal, before his true origins are revealed, appears to have a cushy life with a doctor's former lab assistant. Sure, the guy has uh, some bizarrely sexual taste of art, but it's a pretty nice accommodation relative to his time in the lab. However, the damage was done. Knowing he was sick with stomach cancer, Claudandus used his influence and intelligence to rapidly kill off those he saw as weakening the gene pool, an extreme form of revenge, but one leveled against the wrong enemy. Claudandus may have believed he was protecting other cats from the same fate to make them more feral and able to kill humans who destroyed his innocence. But in reality, Claudandus became more like the humans than he realized. There is no justification to make up for killing hundreds of his own kind 
seeing the bodies of his victims as inferior obstacles. Even after successfully killing Dr. Praterius and escaping the lab, Claudandus was still intent on getting revenge by any means necessary. He found out far too late that two wrongs don't make a right and ended up dying for his cause, with everyone in his orbit having to suffer for it. Joker was his outspoken propaganda minister and misled others into ritual death sacrifices, still not making it out alive. Felicity was an outsider, a hermit living only with her human and helping Francis with information about the cult, but was killed shortly afterward. Uh, brutally, you know, he got her head ripped off. As a film, Philidae follows the novel it was based on very closely. It's great for authenticity and staying true to the author's intentions for the story. This does, however, affect the watching experience, making it feel a bit too info-dumpy and dialogue-heavy at times. The cats talk a lot in this movie. That's definitely a standard and a noir mystery, but I think it would have benefited from a few more atmospheric moments to let us have some breathing room. Sometimes it comes across as more tell, don't show, than I think they intended. Now, there are a few welcome quiet moments. You got Francis leaping over the rooftops to safety. Then there's him meeting Felicity. And then there's him talking with Josiah, which are all pretty nice standouts. But if that's not interesting enough for you, the vivid and horrifying nightmare sequences definitely leave a lasting impression. Well, how about the characters though? We don't really get to know them all that well, aside from Francis. There are vague hints given to the extent of their relationships, but there's way more emphasis placed on to the story instead. But that's a pretty common struggle when adapting a book to a movie format. Some details need to be cut off for time, but it's a delicate balance finding where there's still enough attention being paid to keep the plot engaging. Philidae is far from the only book series to use animals as narrative allegories for real situations. Some of the most famous examples include Richard Adams' Watership Down, George Orwell's Animal Farm, and to reference another World War II contemporary, Mouse by Art Spiegelman. All of these books utilize marginalized characters in the form of animals for a reason, to examine and criticize political and cultural movements and their lingering effects on society. In the case of Mouse, Art Spiegelman made deliberate choices for the animals correlating to specific ethnic groups, mice to represent the Jews, cats for the Nazis, and pigs being Polish citizens. His message was to show how dumb it was to divide people up like animals, how it was a self-destructing metaphor, and it's there to reveal the inanity of the notion itself. Personally, I did notice a pretty distinct difference in the quality of the original subtitled German version versus the English dub. The characters in the English dub tend to talk over each other quite a bit, and there's some lip sync issues as well, which is pretty distracting. But hey, that's Germany for you. They have all the words. Science. 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 Naturwissenschaften. Physical copies of Philidae are pretty tough to come by outside of Europe, as it never received a widespread English release. The English dub alone is only available these days on DVDs from Germany and France, and a few tough to find VHS copies in Australia. Fortunately though, both complete versions of the film have been uploaded to YouTube. <laughs> Censors be damned. Philidae was a truly global project. Most of the animation was done by True Company, based in Germany, but they ended up outsourcing help from 10 other small animation houses to stay on budget. Some of these studios were also involved with other cult classic films like Ferngoli and The Pavel and the Penguin. At the time of its creation, Philidae was the most expensive German animated film ever, costing an estimated 10 million Deutschmarks, roughly 5 million American dollars. But due to its bad marketing, it bombed at the box office and later developed a devoted cult following. Hmm, that's appropriate for this movie, huh? But what makes Philidae memorable today is how shocking it is, especially with the quality of the 2D animation itself. With subject matter as grim as animal testing, the characters have a surprising amount of appeal to their designs. And we can thank character designer Paul Bolger for that one. Previously, Paul worked as an animator on such films as The Land Before Time, All Dogs Go to Heaven, and The Thief and the Cobbler. This would definitely explain the almost Don Bluth-like quality of the animation. The characters all have quite fluid movements, with large expressive faces with a lot of facial nuance. 
Francis alone could be straight out of a Disney movie in any other timeline. You wouldn't expect to see such detailed amounts of squash and stretch being used in a group torture ritual, but damn it, they had a vision. There's also a lot of attention put into the horror sequences. I mean, it's called nightmare fuel for a reason, I guess. The solution to the riddle is actually very simple. But why is Philidae so obscure now? Like excluding the bad marketing, what happened? Well, mostly it boils down to political controversy involving the author, Akif Parenchi. Hey, remember how I mentioned Nazi parallels earlier? Well, there's more to it than that. After the success of Philidae and its subsequent novels, Keefe became more outspoken regarding his political beliefs in the media, with a lot of his views being quite controversial, especially regarding feminism and immigration. In the mid-2010s, he published a series of non-fiction essays with such titles as Germany Gone Mad, The Crazy Cult Around Women, Homosexuals, and Immigrants, and The Big Gayification, When Men Become Women and Women Won't Become Men. <laughs> very, very subtle, dude. At the same time, he was also getting involved with several fringe right-wing groups in Germany, even becoming the keynote speaker for the Begaida, an anti-Islamic movement. His statements at one of their events on October 19th, 2015, were deemed so offensive that he was publicly canceled for them. And when I say canceled, I mean canceled overnight. The following day, on October 20th, 2015, Akif Parenchi was dropped from both of his publishers, Goldman and Random House, who refused to sell his books any longer. Amazon Germany delisted them from their product catalog. The biggest book wholesalers in Germany stopped ordering copies. The backlash was swift and overwhelming. It got so bad that even Parenchi himself thought about immigrating out of Germany. Look, I genuinely don't get what he was expecting to happen, though. When you manage to mess up so badly, you get dumped by your blog's webmaster. You know, simple as that. You done goofed. As such, the Philidae book series has effectively been out of print since 2015. Now, you can still find tons of copies of it online, but it's kind of crazy that Philidae managed to go from a bestseller to a banned book within the author's lifetime. It's pretty ironic how much Akif Parenchi went down a similar path as Claudandis did. At one time, he was writing books with a good message, but he gradually allowed hate to control him. He hasn't seemed to work on much since then publicly, uh, but I hope he manages to get a much needed change in perspective soon. But overall, Philidae stands as a unique animated film for its mature themes and graphic visuals. Yet it wasn't wanton violence. It was trying to make a point, to demonstrate the downward spiral of minds that tread a path of such fanatical thinking. Using cats to tell that tale was brilliant, the same way rapids were used as a conduit for Watership Down to discuss altruistic leadership in society. There's just something about using animals that puts things into perspective for humanity and our many facets of thinking, beliefs, and ideologies. But when it comes to the violent animated films that use animals to do this, I guess I'm two out of three now. I saw Watership Down and I've seen Philidae. All that remains now is Plague Dogs. And yeah, <laughs> This one's gonna be rough. That's not a pun, I swear to God, that was not a pun.